Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I mean, there's a million awesome games, and you guys are choosing to spend your time with us. And that means a lot to me, so thank you guys very much. Um, the format tonight is I have assembled this awesome panel of judges whom I respect, and I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So let me introduce them first, um, get a couple questions to get us started, and as you guys have questions about DCC or running games that you want answered, just feel free to pop them off. Um, so first off, we have the talented Brenda LaSalle. He is author of over <laughs> author of over like probably twenty five titles, probably, probably many more. Um, At least, but we haven't been to yeah, we haven't we haven't verified that. Um, <laughs> most most yeah, he's most famous for his work on X Crawl, which and X Crawl Classics will be coming out next year. We're going to kickstart it uh, early next year. Awesome! Woo! Yeah. 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 That's cool. He's also good in games as a road warrior. Like, if you've played in a con game um, and with somebody working for Gooby Games, odds are it was probably Brendan. Um, directly to my left is the talented Jen Brinkman, probably better known as Judge Jen. <laughs> known her from Spellburn, Sanctum Secorum. Um, but for those of us working for Goodman Games, we know her as the wielder of the pen of death because she's also our editor. Um, and yeah, she's a, one of I our lead proofers. <laughs> Very few, yeah. And she, Jen is merciless <laughs> as a judge and as an editor. <laughs> so, where are you going with this, Harley? <laughs> and of course, Haley Sketch. Haley Sketch, um, she's participated in a number of tournaments, came in third merely because of a dice roll a few years back. And this year, she actually stepped up to run uh, the DCC Open Tournament, um, which for any of you that have had the opportunity to play is like a, a high wire act. Because um, DCC is crazy, right? And the, the goal of the tournament, though, is we need to standardize as much as we can uh, the rulings we're making. And so for Haley to step up take on that responsibility, that mantle, is, is really admirable. I didn't run a first round game. I was terrified. Haley was willing to do it. So, thank you guys for coming out. Um, Alright, so my first and, question. And yourself. Oh, yeah. I'm, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Harley Stroh. Um, I helped uh, Joseph, um, along with Mike and Doug, um, write the first iteration of, of, the, of the rules. I've, I've written some adventure modules. 144 published titles. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to DCC 100 coming out soon. But anyway. <laughs> so, this afternoon, we were, we were playing a DCC tournament. And, um, and at one point, 25 polar bears were summoned into the, uh, the base of, of, of Thieves' House in, in Lankmar to assist in the tournament because somebody, you know, spell burned 30 points or something, and I was like, oh my god, my brain's about to break. So, judges, can you tell us about an instance when DCC broke your brain and what you tried to do about it? Brendan LaSalle. Certainly. Um, well, I too have had the uh, maximum result on a spell check um, thing. Now I'm, I'm ready for it now. I've, I've, I've thought about it, like, but uh, yeah, the, the first time someone was like, 100 hit dice worth? How many brontosauruses is that? And I had like, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of brontosaurus, like five, six. Um, but uh, yeah, I actually, um, for a while, I was running a tenth level adventure, and uh, it nearly killed me. Uh, it was a bad idea, and I probably won't do it again. Um, but uh, yeah, I had uh, an adventure where um, I had uh, yeah, I had two wizards spell dueling, both of which had three spell checks per round. One of which was a patron. Um, you know, and devouring the other one's spells that was going on and such. And uh, at some point I thought, this is just, uh, this is where I die, right here in Lake Geneva. They're going to bury me right by the Gary Con, Gary Gygax Memorial, and I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but seriously, how did, how did you, did, let's give us something useful, how did you adjudicate <laughs> Because, because no, one, my, one of my favorite Brendan LaSalle like quotes, Brendan. one of my favorite Brendan LaSalle quotes is, you know, when, when that crazy stuff comes up, Brendan's answer is, all right, He's not going to put up a wall. He's not going to say no. He's going to lean into it. Yeah. So, how did you adjudicate five brontosaurus? I, you know what I did? Um, okay, the, the brontosaurus is, I just, I said, uh, okay, so each one had, I figured out some like 19 hit dice, or however many hit dice it was. Right. I think it was actually five and 20 hit dice. You were using your ADD muster manual. Yeah. To be. So I had, roll those up real quick. And while they were doing that, 
that stalled me for just enough time for me to figure out what their attack roll was. I just kind of, and I pulled it up in a very official looking notebook. So they must think that in this notebook I had stats for how much damage your bombasaurus could do. But I just came up with it. I thought, all right, well, it can stomp and tail sweep. They can do this. They weigh 60 tons. So if it steps on you, it's a death save. You know, I mean, I just sort of, while he was me rolling up the hit points, I just, um, just took a deep breath and uh, agitated it. You know, you can't, um, you know, get close enough in that kind of situation. Don't stress it. Don't, don't stress what you've done. Don't stress what it has to be. Make sure it's a maximum fun that you're going to do by not delaying the game as much as you can and just coming up with a close enough, on the fly, brontosaurus. You know, what's a brontosaurus' armor class? Anybody? Anybody? Seventeen! <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, right? Why don't we like, know this? <laughs> it shouldn't be a twenty. That's insane. Nor a thirteen. So seventeen seemed good. And that was, you know, so. Did you make your players Brontosauri? <laughs> <laughs> no, they uh, they won that one. Uh, pretty. Uh, that was Symptom of the Universe in the UK. They won that one. They, uh, they pretty much stomped the heck out of uh, the, uh, the Rook army of the Emperor of the Moon. <laughs> And uh, I was satisfied. So I, I just stalled for a little bit, came up with a plan, executed, you know. But I mean, if you, once you've run enough, if you, if you, you know, read the entire monster section and kind of get an idea of what all of them should be like, you don't have to memorize it, but you just get an idea what their armor class should be about at whatever given level, you know, and you get close enough. Thank you. Haley, has DCC ever broken your brain? I think the closest I got was today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, running, the story? running the tournament, my group was just, they were, they got to a room where they had multiple options. So they, half of them wanted to do this, and they were, it was trapped, so they were trying, some of them were almost hitting the trap, but not quite, and some of them were trying to get into another room. So I just had to kind of sit them back and say, alright, everyone stop. Now one at a time, in initiative order, you're going to tell me what you're going to do. Yes. <laughs> And I made sure that they were very clear and that none of them triggered the trap. And I like I just had to kind of sit them down because my party, I loved it because they were so excited. So they, they had a lot of, you know, promise and they were, they were very pumped about the idea. And it all just kind of came out at once and like bubbled over. So I had to kind of calm them down a little bit. And then they, again, just started doing crazy things. And like Brendan said, you lean with it. You, can I do this? Of course you can. You can try. <laughs> you can yeah. try as much as you want. And you just kind of have to let them do what they're going to do and like lean into it and let them have fun. Did you have to narrow it down to the same type of situation with a bunch of animals getting uh, summoned in. Doesn't have to be. Yeah, right. The animal summoning <laughs> I, breaks I mean, DCC. It, it, well, yeah, when you hit the top number, uh, at least that the person was going for, and we ended up with like a dozen lions in the middle of uh, the sinister sutures of the sempstress. But. You're not a lion tamer, you don't speak a lion, you can't tell them to go investigate things for traps. That's not how this works. You can have them help attack things, and of course being predatory animals, they're going to leap for these spiders that are coming at you, the giant spiders. That's great. But for the rest of it, they can't detect traps, so by attrition, the player just let them kind of wander off. And, okay, how many do we have left? Um, have you followed them? Do you know which rooms they've gone into? Because not all the doors are closed. Do you know what traps have been set off and what monsters have been wow. alerted to their presence yet? Uh, no, you don't. You also don't know how many are now trying to find the owner of the lions. <laughs> so, all of these things coming at you at once, and you're down to two lions? <laughs> Just based on hit points alone. Uh -huh. The lions is a currency. So, Jen, would it be fair to distill that down into, like, you, you, you consider kind of the internal logic. So, you have this completely illogical thing happening. 20 lions appear out of nowhere, but then you you, drew, you own cats. You know cats are insane. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you, but, but internally... They're going to investigate everything and pull every string, yeah. yeah. But, like, internally, like the, it sounds like the internal logic of your game held true, like... Well, especially if, if she's not making sure she knows where all of them are at one point then she doesn't know where they all are at one point. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, one more question for me, and then we'll, we'll open it up to everybody else. I'm just, yeah, for you guys. Um, so, so DCC is oftentimes dealing with Gonzo, but also often it's also the judges have to not... 
judges aren't killing characters. Characters kill characters. Bad decisions <laughs> kill characters. But um, players kill characters. Yes, yeah, but you are. <laughs> it, 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 to make the game really hum, you have to not be afraid to dispense death and be a, a death dealer. Brendan, how did you come to peace with killing off PCs and Dungeon Crawl Classics? You know, the uh, first time you do it, you kind of wince. But, um, you know, the truth is, I, I my philosophy is that if there's zero chance for their characters to die, then no one's having any fun. Why would you even play a game like that where there was just, you know, no chance of forward and such? And um, I used to run games like that where it was extreme, you know, in different systems where it was extremely hard to kill anybody, just, you know, a across the board. And I, I hope, it's for me, it's refreshing as both a GM and as a player to be in a game that's that lethal to where um, mm. you can't ever, whatever level you are, you absolutely cannot rest on your laurels. And I've seen players commit miracles of survival and of incredible deaths that could have been avoided, but just a few bad decisions and a few rolls there and such. You know, um, I know. I, again, I just lean into it. I'm like, yeah, that's right. You know, if, you know, make up a new character real quick or, or whatever it happens. We're all hand to a new PC with it. You know, if it's like for a convention game, I don't want if someone dies in the first encounter. You know. Very often, I will try to fill in, and I still want people to sit and enjoy the game and have a good time. Right, because they bought that ticket. They bought that yeah. ticket, you know. Um, in the last hour, I probably wouldn't do that. You know what I mean? I think like, at that point, you've, you've had your time. You know what I'm saying? You know, if it's in the last room, you know, like I don't want it to be like you know, a new group of adventurers are now fighting the dragon, and Mike dies. And, Here comes Sam. We have no idea. He's just in the game now. You know, like, I can't do that. But uh, I think it's a, a good lesson to. Yeah, you know, right. So it's a. Uh, I try to be more precious about the story than about the characters. Haley, when was your last TPK? Uh, yesterday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did it go down? Um, they just didn't have enough people. They had a small party. It just they just couldn't couldn't swing it. They did their best. They were a great group. Loved them. They just couldn't swing it with that many people. For me, killing players is never really been an issue. Um, <laughs> she was born to it. Was to say, yeah. <laughs> um, at age age nine, as a player, I killed another player. So it wasn't. That was really, wasn't it your brother? No, no it was not. Well, that came later. It was Jeff Rians. Yeah. It was Jeff Rians. It was me or him. I made the tough choice. Um, <laughs> no, so for me, yeah, like like Brendan said, if there's no death, there's no fun. And at a certain point, the players start to the players understand that. You know, when you start joking about death, they'll start joking about death, and it, if you have the right group, they always take it well. They, they know death is part of it, and it makes it more fun, especially in common games. You're supposed to die at the end. If you didn't die at the end, did you really give it your all? <laughs> <laughs> and Jen, DCC was the first game you ran. How did you come acculturated to the, the characters die? I had been so exposed to all of the GMs and DMs, etc., who were cheering for TPKs. And to me, that's not fun, especially if you're planning on a six-hour session at your game store. So I would actually feel bad, and I would do the same thing as Brendan and say, here, please bring in a couple of zero levels at least to stay engaged, which is something I learned from you. And the other way is to roll my dice out in the open. I'm like, All right, guys, I've got a plus two coming at you. Whatever lands, lands. So terribly sorry. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So, so you guys, you, you've met our people. You got to have a sense of their personalities and the way they run games. What questions do you guys have about running DCC? About your game? Yes, sir. So, um, on the DCC Rocks uh, Facebook page, this question was posed at, at one point, um, and I, I kind of like to hear all of your opinions. So, out of if you're doing it kind of the lazy GM way, which is to string modules together and right, kind of figure out a way to superimpose a, a narrative around all of that. Maybe it's not, maybe that's not the right way to put it. I love doing that. Yeah. It's not lazy. <laughs> I'm a self-described lazy judge, okay? So, uh, we love you. That's your Crown Classics you. loves you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, like, so I've, I've done like Hole in the Sky lead into Quarter Chaos, which was, uh, it, it was fun, but it went a little awry. Um, but, uh, you know, what, if you were to kind of pick modules that you think uh, intuitively kind of float into each other in terms of narrative and, and type, um, kind of, what are, what are your opinions, what modules would you pick? Nice. Brendan, you want to start? No. <laughs> Alright, I'll, I'll go because I'll yeah. give everybody time. Yeah. Like, maybe you guys write all your own stuff. Um, 
So you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for from from sailors. From sailors, I go to um, Doom of the Savage Kings, and then from there, like I like so. So you know, they started in a small village. They went to kind of a slightly larger town, and then you know, from there, you can kind of pick up. And there's they're now they're accomplished. You know, they have their their kind of their boots underneath them. You know, they're. Yeah, they're level one, two or three, you know, for DCC, which is pretty BA, you know, compared to other stuff. And so at that point, like with the Lankmar stuff, you know, I like to bring them into town, and so they get to experience Lankmar as 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 foreigners, and it's just, it's just this wash of this amazing decadent city just pouring over them. You know, I'm, I think back to like the Conan, you know, novel, not novels, but stories where you know, where, he, where he comes into town and you know he sits down at the bar and everyone's looking at him because he's just insane barbarian out of, out, of, out of Samaria that no one's ever seen before. And so then, you know, then I drop into like, like, like gang lords is, is a nice one, even though it's not necessarily level appropriate, you know, because um, this is just for first level, but the, the, I like, find that PCs are so often like out of their element that when they, when they, when they come to the city, they have to, all of a sudden there's like these, these social contracts where, you, you know, they, they've just spent the last two adventures like cutting a bloody swath through their foes. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, you can kill everybody in this room, but that just that just earns you like ten thousand enemies. Like let's let's find a way that we we have to deal with this that doesn't that, that it isn't solved so simply. And then, in fairness, by that point, you know, I'm two maybe three or four modules in, um, especially in Lake Bar, the the, the resolving the adventures <laughs> becomes an adventure of itself, right? Because they've created so many complications with patrons and and you know and with Mingobble, and, and so at that point, you know, it, it starts. To, to diffuse itself, and the and the and the, and the, the players' actions by that point have built up to this point where they're they're invested in their characters, they're invested in their characters' friends, and and they're trying to resolve all this and, and wrap it up without without everybody dying. So that that's 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 my arc, but that's been my arc since I was like an 18 year old kid, you know, wanting to play in City of Greyhawk. Like, you know, that that's my heart of hearts. Um, but Brittany, there. What would you like to do? Okay, I am probably the worst person to answer that question because I've only, I, I run nine, one shots 99% of the time. The longest campaign I've run went four games from zero levels through just under, so they actually made it the second and we got all excited about it. They never played again until I moved. Um, and uh, <laughs> when I do do stuff, I'm almost always playtesting and doing homebrew things. You know what I'm saying? Tell us about your X crawl campaign. Spitfire, right? let's go. Okay, but if you want to do an X crawl, uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I would convert. You'd have to convert the old ones into modern DCC. But if you're going to do it in X crawl, um, you want to start with the uh, Memphis crawl. This is for my home game. And the, go to the Memphis crawl. The second one is St. Louis. St. Louis um, is very easy in the beginning, but then the monsters all get loose. You have to fight them backstage. Um, and they get out into the neighborhoods, and that becomes a whole thing. That DJ loses his job, and they bring in a really savage DJ uh, devastator who like changes all of that. Um, so then, like the entire timbre of the dungeon changes at that point. Um, for the third one, I would then go into um, the uh, Studio City crawl, um, have them all go like now they're getting famous, they do a little Hollywood, and they get agents and things, and they get money. And then I would drop them clean in the middle of my new one. Um, uh, uh, Swack Iron Murder Queen, which I'm clay testing this weekend, uh, when they hit the skids. So, like I said, it would be a whole arc from them going up, 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 and down, 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 and trying to get back up. So, that's how I would do it in Next Crawl. Um, By the way, Swack Iron Murder Queen is a great, it's a great game. Oh, I thank you. That that's awesome. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm probably less prepared than Brendan for this one. Um, I, again, I, like Brendan, I, I run con games or play con games, so I don't really have a string. Um, really, I feel like any adventure module can be strung one after another. There's not like a specific sequence. I think throwing random ones together is what makes players interested because they, they, you never know what you're going to encounter next. You know, one second you're in a city and then the next you're fighting in a den of wolves that's, you know, seven dimensions. You know, like you never know what's going to happen. So I think just random adventures always works. <coughs> we did, uh, in my home campaign, Sailors into Doom. So I think that's always a solid start. You can never go wrong if you start with Sailors. <laughs> you can't, can't go wrong there. You know, one of, one of the cool things of the appendix in literature is, is that, like, you read a lot of the, the Fafford and Grey Mouser stories, is they're, they're doing something different. <laughs> like, every, every story is like, well, how did they get from point A to point B? I don't know. He's on a boat. He's headed to the Rhyme Islands. And so, if um, one of the things I do is I run a, a library game for a bunch of kids. 
and the ones that show up that week, they're having that adventure, and then they'll keep the same characters, but the ones that show up next week, you know, they may appear somewhere completely new. That's sometimes tough to sell to players, because a lot of times we've been sold on the idea of the campaign arc, or, I mean, you know, we're going we're gonna to march your characters from first level to 36th, <laughs> and, and there's going to be, you know, there's going to be a thread that makes sense this whole way, but that breaks, right? Like, when the players decide, well, <laughs> I'm not a kingmaker, I'm going that way. <laughs> um, all of a sudden, you know, my, my, my campaign arc that I just crafted for the last two years, and my, you know, mm -hmm. is, is nothing. So, um, you know, yeah, just, yeah. All right, Jen. I did have a campaign that lasted nearly three years, and honestly, for all of the judges that are buying the modules, you want to use them, right? Or at least take parts of them and use them in the places you like. Uh, before I was comfortable doing anything outside the box, it was Sailors into Stephen Newton's Attack of the Frogs. Nice. So I threw in some third party stuff, keep them on their toes. Uh, and then directly over to Tower of the Black Pearl. Oh. And that became so formative in the campaign because of that Black Pearl and because of the merchant that was involved and the players would come and go because it was an open table and when I had a player return from a long hiatus I threw the merchant back in there and the next game there was a little wanted sign drawn up with three of the original characters from Sailors and it all just kind of rolled in and I will admit to a little bit of bias in that every other campaign I threw in was written by that guy. So now whenever I break open something, Bob's response is always, um, I'm going to either lose a character or it's going to be permanently scarred and, uh, yeah, well of the worm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, next question. Sir. Uh, so I guess my question is the opposite of that. Okay. Uh, so usually when I'm running games, I do either at a brewery or a game store, but I only have, I guess the game store, I have like three hours from the yeah. time people are supposed to show up, they never show up <laughs> late, uh, <laughs> until the store is closed. Yeah. And so uh, do you have any suggestions for how to condense, uh, like, condense uh, modules for a very short time where you get players in? You, and usually I'm running for new players, so the idea is kind of like, Hey, if you haven't played an RPG in forever, you're just curious. Like, here's a nice small chunk, so you're not like stuck at my table for six hours. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. What's what's what are your tips for uh, your special tips? Yeah. So if you <laughs> okay, if you're if you're trying to like demonstrate the system, okay. So um, look at the entire adventure. All right. Figure out what you can leave in and make sure that every character gets a chance to do their special thing. Okay, so there's got to be something with traps and locks. There's got to be some damage and some healing and some undead for the cleric. There has to be, you know, a couple of good fights in there. There's got to be some impossible things that only the wizard can handle. So as long as you have, you know, whatever for all, you know, for all the other characters, you should have something in there for each one that only they can do and they make, gives them really their chance to shine. And then you can eliminate the other stuff. As long as you have, you know, I mean, obviously, usually, if you're looking at a published thing, okay, you got to keep the beginning, and then you got to keep the end. So you look at the middle bits, and you say, "What can I cut out of this, or fast forward <laughs> over, or, or simplify ultimately, in order to, um, in order to, like, make sure that everyone still gets to, you know, you know, you know, have their hurrah for whatever it is, and then, and then, and then, you know, go ahead and do it." So, um, yeah, so just, you know. You know, cut out whatever you can out of the middle that won't be redundant. You know what I mean? If there are two great big fights where, you know, one, you know, your group fights against a group of other, you know, other creatures, cut one of them. It doesn't even matter which one. You know what I'm saying? Cool. So like, if you like, what one thing that I run into is like, I cut something, but like, ah, but there was a clue or something that put that Do clue you just, somewhere just else. Drop it wherever. <laughs> yep. Awesome. And you know what? If, if, if they look, they're like, well, we check under the table. The clue is under the table. <laughs> <laughs> if you're cutting it up like that, especially for a one shot, yeah. don't be like, no, you can't find it. It's been 20 minutes of your precious T minus three hours whenever they get their time and, and you know, having them like lollygag around. Wherever they look, there's a clue. You know, if they interrogate a guy, that guy knows something. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, if it's if it's a, an item they have to find for whatever reason, somebody has it. You know, cool. cool. Or they know where it is. That's even more fun sometimes. Sir, right. so, yeah, um, I love this system. I think it's awesome. Thank I've you. never played. Uh, I played it for the first time yesterday. Yay! But how how do I um? Yeah, I guess uh. Right. 
my group uh, is really stuck in their ways. They're big D and D three point five players. Oh, nice. Okay. It for years, and that is you know an insane mess of, of a game. Whenever, especially when you get in all the supplemental stuff and you got sure. like factotums and war blades and things running around. Um, I'm exhausted. Just how do I convince <laughs> these stubborn, stubborn people? To play a game like DCC I that I know they'll love, yeah, if I can only question. like hide it under their pillow at night or something. <laughs> uh, or just like, uh, Jim best, best way to do it? Wait till that one game when your GM's ready to call out sick and cancel game and say, wait, guys, if you still want to get together, come on over to my place and I'll run you through something. That way you haven't, you don't have this wasted night. Right. And are you, are you introduce the them to something. We've actually, the last two years, we've had kind of a, um, a campaign where we each take turns telling a story, but the story is linear and shared, you know, it takes place well, in the same universe. That's we, even better. Do it, it on your yeah. turn. <laughs> Do it on your week. Yeah. 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 It, it is true. You find a lot, like, a lot of players, they're just, we are stubborn, and we do like what we like, but we're also just happy to play a game when it comes down to it. But I would add, be sure to give them pre-generated characters so that you don't stall them with all of this new stuff that is just going to be thrown in their faces and they have to digest new things. Just give them the character sheets and start the scenarios. Yeah. And if you really, if you really have to cheat it, this is some shameful nonsense here I'm going to share with y'all. <laughs> Shut the door. So, <laughs> uh, come up with your scenario. Make it a homebrew thing. Um, tell them that you're looking forward to submitting it to the Gong Farmer's Almanac and would they mind being play touches in the credits for it? Yeah. 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 I was going to say, if once you do convince them to play, just make sure they're ready for death. Because <laughs> <laughs> if they've That's been in really a campaign for so long, yes. they might be scared to die. Make sure you like adjust them to, you have four characters, those four will die, you will get more. <laughs> They might have fun for the first time. I mean, not for the first time, but they I mean, might be yeah. really enjoy it. The first time you're yeah, so, you know, nice change, you know, you would be so forged. worried about protecting a certain character. Death can be a nice change of pace. <laughs> you can just let go. Yeah, you can worry about it. Yeah. All right, who's next? All right. Yes, sir. I'm curious. When I've only run a few games, and I've played a ton of them, you know, everywhere. And one of the things that I've noticed in a lot of the games is player engagement. How, many, how do you handle the wet and roll? How do you handle the player that just kind of runs along with everyone or just kind of looks up and goes, well, what did they do? Um, something like that. Because so, they're doing a lot of exactly. this. Exactly. <laughs> I've banned phones from when I've played my game. So if it's mm -hmm. on the table, you get a penalty. Monsters attack people with phones. Yes. Jim <laughs> <laughs> what other techniques do you have? <laughs> Sorry, because I you, thought you, I was getting up for You ran a lot in, in game stores where you were proselytizing. Yeah, I, I am the chief acolyte. Um, the, the introduction of the fleeting luck mechanic that DCC Lankmar gave us has given us such a tool to keep the players engaged. Because it, you always have the one or two people that, that have the quips, they've got all the smart ideas, and then you've got these people that are very quiet, they're afraid to speak up because you have the peanut gallery over here. So don't reward them for every time they're funny wait for the softer spoken ones to finally give a good idea and reward that. And encourage them to keep speaking up. Uh, when I usually run at home, it's with a bunch of teenage girls. So there is... Naturally. <laughs> there's a lot of distraction and texting and gossip. So keeping them focused is a challenge, but I try and it helps if you keep an initiative order. Even if sometimes you're out of combat for an extra round, like everything's dead, go back through initiative order once time, once again, because if you let them all do something at once, then two are talking here, one's yelling at you, the other three are arguing with each other. So you have to try and, okay, everyone can talk to me, we just need to go, we need to keep it organized, and then that tends to help if you, if you give everyone a specific turn, they feel like they have to do something. So it kind of encourages them to be part of the group again. Yeah. Look at you teaching old dogs yeah. here. Yeah, right? like, out of combat admission of water. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Who's next? Sir. Do any of you have a favorite, just an absolute favorite moment from running this game that you would like to share with us? Oh, nice. 
Hey, <laughs> Liz is killing everybody. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I got one. <laughs> I, I, I think mine involves you. <laughs> I what happened. Right. Uh, the, the night that I, I think I leveled up was uh, Gary Kahn of last year. It was the last table, and things were just going you know, haywire as they do. And this thief says, well, I'm going to go disguise myself. So she goes around a corner, it was a four. So she comes out with like a distinct feature too. Like, she comes out with a long mustache on her finger. <laughs> and then at some point puts it on the other finger so she can actually roll dice and write with the sand. The person sitting next to her, also a thief, rolls a nat 20 on his disguised self roll. So he comes out looking exactly like her, with the mustache. <laughs> and for the next two and a half hours, I just couldn't even move from the spot I was in. I was laughing so hard. It was probably the best game ever, especially when the 11-year-old kid comes up, shakes my hand, and says, I wish every game could be that one, that fun. And that's partially your fault. <laughs> Never got it was a heck of a moment. Mustaches. Yeah. yeah. My, my favorite's got to be the OG, the first game I ever played in Gary Khan. What Gary Khan was that? Two, three, four. four? One, one of the first Gary Khans. Uh, I was nine. I, my mom still had to supervise me at tables. They didn't trust me alone yet. Um, <laughs> she did have snacks and keep my brother and I like supervised. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't even know which module it was, but you know, naturally Leviathan comes through the ice, and there are icebergs flipping and. I'm hanging on to a spear that I stabbed into the iceberg, and one of my friends is hanging on to my, my shoe trying to save himself, and then the spear starts to come out of the iceberg, and my shoe's falling off, and it's either both of us go or one of us goes, so my first thought is, shake off my boot. <laughs> um, so yeah, I kind of knocked one of my companions to his death. Um, I actually think he might have survived it. He did, yeah. He did survive it, um, but as a nine-year-old, that kind of earns you a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> so that's definitely one of my favorite moments. I'll forever remember my first game because... Yeah. And I also, Who's your uh, judge for that? Yeah, I also was just going to add, that was Harley uh, standing on chairs, leaning over the table to mimic the Leviathan. <laughs> like, at, he's standing over the table on chairs, completely terrifying all of us. So that, I will never forget that first yeah. game. Check with dads before you and, leave our children. And <laughs> moms still let her play. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So aside from uh, reading module before you run it for the first time at a home game, which can often be a different experience from a con versus versus a home game. Uh, so it, you know the con game itself, like, I get a judge in front of that game twenty times, and that's going to be a pretty pretty oil experience. Uh, but coming, you know, bring that home to a, to a group, that may be the first time and probably the only time they're going to run it again. Uh, so I guess tips and in, in, in tricks kind of prepping for the familiarity of the of the module. So there isn't so much uh, going back through and you know reading uh, sections out of it or, or trying to search for for uh, you know uh, that. that in the room or you know something that's sure. uh, kind of hidden in there. I, I feel like um, specifically with the DCC Adventures I think that the um, the maps are your best friend. You know what I mean? The maps mm -hmm. are so well illustrated and they're, they've got so much personality, you know. I, I love the old school maps that are just blue and rigid because I love them, but not because they're good, you know what I mean? But when you actually see them with the illustrations over on the side and such, to me, if you get to know the, uh, the map really well, you know what I mean, that's what you should be able to practice on, you know what I mean? You get to the point where all you need, to, to me, you know, the better you, you get to you know, understand what's going on, uh, actually there are visualize the page, the smooth it's going to be for the entire adventure. So I'd really focus on that. That'll really let you, you know, that's the, uh, that's the, to me, the, one of the great innovations of like what we do with the DCC is that, that really illuminated map, for lack of a better term. And, um, you know, <laughs> when the monster's drawn right on there, you're like, oh, that's where that thing is, you know what I mean? So um, for when I do publish, when I do publish that, which is a ton, that's why I always really concentrate on that part to get started with. That really helps me out. For me, uh, read it once or twice, again, if you really want to underline, like, something's AC and it's hit points, so you don't have to read through all the stats and you can just look at it, or, you know, sticky notes always help, but players don't know if you're wrong, you know, that's what you have to remember, they're not, they're not reading the module with you, memorize as best you can, and if you get something wrong, they don't know, <laughs> they're not going to call you on it, well, some might, um, they're not going to, they're not going to call you on it, they're not going to, they don't know.
no. So memorize as best you can, but you don't have to know every detail. And if you need a second to pause, throw something at your players that they aren't expecting. Have them argue with each other, and then while they're fighting, you read. Like for real? <laughs> I mean, that works, yeah. An actual porcupine. Yes. Yeah. Or if you're an over-prepper, like I was at the very beginning, I was copying or printing out every single module that I ran, and highlighting everything ahead of time so I didn't lose it, and then I had the great idea of trying to chronicle all of these sessions, so I would write down like the highlight moments. So I would do that on the printouts because I'm not going to do that in my book. But yeah, I, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> but I totally understand to feel comfortable with a module. You do want to prep yourself to a certain extent. But yeah, again, with the clue thing, if you forget something, throw it in the next room. Sure. All right, so early in the, uh, the, the our event here, we discussed animal summoning and challenging animal summoning. Again. <laughs> so I, when I first got the DCC core book, I started reading, I well, pushed everything up to spells, flipped through spells, glanced at them and moved on. And then later on as I played, I realized there were some spells I really should have read more of. <laughs> Especially yeah. after spell burn, corruption, adding a lot of stuff. Uh, are there any other first level spells that you would suggest that players should really read through, GMs should read through carefully uh -huh. before they start GMing above zero level play? Yeah. Oh yeah. Make sure you think you know how runic alphabet mortal works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <You> don't. <laughs> but be confident in your wrongness. <laughs> That's good. I, I would say uh, rope work, because it's not what yeah. old school D&D fans are used to. I, maybe part of it could be, but for the most part, <laughs> eh, no. <laughs> I don't know, I, I just, I think it's kind of more interesting when you, you expect something and then your players, you know, roll a 34 on a spell check and now you have 25 lions and 10 polar bears. <laughs> I think that adds a whole new element of surprise, so, well, reading spells is good, I think a nice element of surprise. Well, your players are able to shock you once in a while. Yeah. Normally, you're the one shocking them. When they can throw something at you that makes you take a step back, I think that's a whole other level of interesting. Legit, there was one episode of Spellburn where you guys dealt with one spell that was super broken in match. It was like, remember, like, could you narrow that down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was it was like or something. Or was it like, a, like, detect evil allows you to, like, navigate Oh yeah, detecting was was there anyway. Yeah. So. Maybe, sure, just, maybe, just, that. maybe just read the last <laughs> entry of every spell. I mean, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, not, the worst, yeah. that's not the worst device. If you get a general idea of how The best, the best person to ask is actually Jim Wamba. Because I'll bet you he knows the 34 <laughs> result on every spell in that book. Yeah. That's all he can. Because that's how he breaks convention logic. Yeah. Wizard Ben. That's it. So. One, one thing that I'd like to ask about is, like, I love the art, and I love the maps and the books. I'd love to see, like, a high-quality downloadable that I can then throw up on a screen oh. to show people the map. For sure. Because I love that visual aspect of it. And I, I was doing Purple Planet, and I love all the pictures and the imagery in that. And if I could get it to throw up on a TV screen or have it out on the table, like, that would be just choice. So it's a suggestion that the resolution be higher so that it can... Yeah, exactly. So I don't have to scan the module and then print it out and it look, you know, cruddy because I'm not good at doing that, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I, the, my question is, is I was running Peril of the Purple Planet and I decided in my infinite stupidity to allow the players to play themselves because I took them from Earth. And transported them to the <laughs> transported them to the planet, and I, I made like thousands of copies of them that all were fighting amongst themselves. But it turned out it actually turned out to go really horribly. Ultimately, <laughs> so, everyone was really bad at role playing themselves. <laughs> suggestion for you. Stat up everybody and then pass the sheets one to the next. Right? Oh, they can just play each other. Oh, they will never speak again. <laughs> My best advice would be just don't ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was an effort in futility, but it was really funny in the meantime. 
that's all. Gotta find your fuzz. I'm sorry, this panel is so boring. <laughs> <laughs> Joan of Arc. Yeah, well, uh, I, I kind of want to go back to the, the question before with regards to familiars, animal familiars and that. <laughs> um, I have a player who, whenever he gets a character and has um, an animal, you know, a pig or whatever, Anyway, he's got oh, a zero level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. His zero level was a beekeeper, named him Buzz, and he had a hive with him. And he really wants to be able to use the animal in some creative way. So I, I am not one to really want to bother with that. I, I, I really, <laughs> I, I find in myself as a judge to, I, I really need to maybe be a little bit more open with some things. But I have a housemate who uh, loved the idea and um, let him put a queen with his hive and make a hive fur on his back and then stat it up. He gets to roll how many, he, he can command the, the um, somehow <laughs> command the queen to send out these fighters. And then, you know, on, on a certain percentage roll, so many bees get to go out. And depending on how many bees there are, this is what the damage is and, and stuff. And I'm like, you know, that's all fine and good. You, you do that. But, um, you know, to, and then he wants to try to work it as a familiar. Can I see through? No, you're not going to be able to see through. It's not a familiar. This is an animal that, you know, maybe you can... Well, it's, I'm a really good of, beekeeper. I can send those bees out and fight. Instead of no, yeah. maybe go find a patron who has the power to teach you that kind of spell. Yeah, send them on a quest. Yeah, good idea. But yeah. you also, I mean, you have such awesome leverage over this character now. <laughs> no, like at any point, you know, that giant comes along and, you know, pss, 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 I killed this character. Oh, oh like, my like, oh my goodness! Like, Early no, on, no, I no, killed like, this You're living the dream. You have something a DCC character. Loves yeah. like it's something they care about. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a murder hobo. This is not a murder hobo. They, they are they, they love weakness. something. Yeah. So you you have like it's not even you're not even setting the hook. Yeah. He, he, like, he, he went on vacation and he found this button that says Queen B and he gave it to me. <laughs> like like. Uh, well, you know, like you can't convince the party to do something, but the bees are getting cold because it's winter. We better go on a quest to yeah. the volcano. <laughs> no. Oh my goodness, they all have bee mites. We must go to It's the, way uh, too smoky like, in here. Yeah. 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 Just one DCC. You can make that party do whatever you want because this character cares about something. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love so. That. Yeah, the thing that occurs to me is when you got the guy with the pig and he wants the pig to be able to do stuff. Okay, so the human stays just a normal zero level. Zero level. Level up the pig. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, is there anything that you've been through, like as a judge, that has drastically changed how you run the game? Oh, uh, can I add? Jump yes. <laughs> um, in, in 3E and Fourth Edition, I I was a horrible fudger. I would roll all my dice behind the screen. Um, I would I would cheat for the players and try to make every session end on the, that one guy rolling a 20 out in the open, and you know it was horrible. My, my players didn't enjoy it. I'm pretty sure it was transparent because I'm terrible at <laughs> poker. Um, and it wasn't until I, I I saw I saw DCC and it was like, oh, you're supposed to kill off four characters, and somebody maybe one lives. I'm like, this is nonsense. Like this is the thing I'm writing for. Like this is baloney. Until I played it, and I I played it for the first time, rolling my dice out in the open, and it was a transformative experience. Like literally a transformative experience for the way I judge. So much so that like. These days, I'll just have the players roll all my rolls for me. It's like, oh, the uh, you know the the ogre is plus three to hit. He's trying to hit you. You roll a d20 and, and see if he add three to it. See if he hits your armor class. Um, I thought you were just trying to disguise the fact that you forgot your dice. Well, that's <laughs> uh, Michael Curtis let me dice. Um, but but yes. Yeah, so, so for myself, the transformative piece was rolling out in the open and and what Haley spoke to is is really being honest with you players so they know the risk is real and so. Their triumphs are theirs to own. Their their tragedies are usually because they screwed up. And uh, but that that was that was it for me in DCC, and that's how I run my games now. Um, Brendan, yeah. Sure. Um, I would say the actually the first time I ever played, um, it was uh, Joseph Goodman. Um, he ran two scenarios back to back. It was a funnel and then a higher level adventure. 
Uh, one of the things I always hated in my old game, um, you know, whenever I was running old, um, you know, anything, is party infighting and betrayal and the one thief who keeps passing me, you know, it's like, I'm going to rob everybody and such. <laughs> I, get, I, get, I find that exhausting and it's so, and my, my friends would get all personal about it and, you know, friendships would end and such. But we played one time um, in that game and I'm, I'm still learning how the spell uh, things worked. And um, he takes me aside at one point and the, this one this magical entity that we were investigating reaches out to my character, the wizard, and it's like, if you'll betray the party and destroy them here, I'll give you unbelievable power forever. And I was like, well, yes, I'm going to do that. You know, sure. <laughs> and I had this great setup. I'm like, all right, you know, the, I said, the patron told me that all these enemies are to commence. You guys stand here, right there, okay? And then I'll be in the back, ready to do the spell. That'll So you got to hold them off. And then, you know, instead I just tried to blast them or something. <laughs> it didn't go great. They, they turned around and, and kicked the mess out of me. They just, you know, they short work. And it was like, but it was, it was really fun. And I was like, okay, actually, like, once you stop being so precious about your characters, you don't mind inviting when someone gets, when someone gets killed, you lose their feelings hurt, you know? And that really sort of, like, set me in the mindset of how DCC really gets played and designed. You know what I mean? Like, when you, when you stop stressing... This, your character and stop making it really precious. Then you can have exciting moments like that and not be, you know, exciting. You know, even things where if we, you know, call it antisocial or whatever within your group and such. You know, that whole like murder humble mindset. No one gets mad if at the end of the day it's like, well, we're all dead. New characters. So that that really made me that put me into focus of the entire game. So that really changed it up for me. Haley. For me, I was I was always I was the one noodle at the table. I was quiet. I was on my phone, but I, I didn't really speak much. I was very quiet. I was scared to share my ideas. I thought, you know, I'm young. I don't I don't have a lot to bring to the table. I'll sit here and I'll hit stuff. And then as I got older and played in more games, it was okay. You can be a smart aleck. You can argue with people. You can have different ideas. And so slowly, DCC brought me out into. Now I'm yelling at players when they roll 20s because I want to kill you, stop rolling well, you know? And so it, it kind of brought me out to like, it's okay to be loud, it's okay to be sassy. I don't know if I believe that you were ever me. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe, but I once was, yeah. Jen? Um, you know, being a new judge, being new to running games in the first place, the idea of sandboxing had me quaking in my boots. But then I realized it's really just a matter of, I really like this monster in this module, but I really like the setting over here. So if I blend them and, uh, I don't know, forget both modules and just kind of try to make it up as I go along and recreate the scene, I'm sandboxing. Holy cow, I'm doing this. Okay, let's do this. Uh, so it, it's really been, improv is good, but improv and having fun with your players is even better. All right, let's do one more. Sir. Uh, what's like a recent uh, book or show that's really inspired you guys lately? Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> uh, well, actually, okay, um, I'm a big uh, Joyce Carol Oates fan, and I'm reading uh, one that she did, I mean, ten years ago now. It's the tattoo. The ta um, it's the one with the girl with the tattoos. And um, I read that and I thought, oh, this would make you know. It's like this this you know sad academic who like brings in this young person into the, like their you know um, into their life and all the conflict and such. And I'm like, oh, that's going to be my next adventure. Like I think that's going to be. Uh, I'm, I'm still not sure how it's all going to take place, but I think that the. Um, the older, like, I'm, I'm, I want to do a funnel with all kids, where the older, like, wise one takes in all these sort of, like, orphans and such, and then something terrible happens, and they have to, like, run around in this guy's, like, tower and find all of the knickknacks and things to, like, defend it against whatever it is. It's still, it's still half-baked, but I read that. I just got caught up in it. I was like, oh, this would be such a great idea for adventure, you know? Look, look, you know what? Look to non-adventure stuff to write adventure stuff, I think, is, a, is kind of how I do it. That's a lot of pressure. I don't, I don't watch that much TV. I don't know if high school counts as a reality show. <laughs> I kind of I use that as a lot of it because there's so much going on that you, you just got to pull from that. So I'd say high school for sure. <laughs> Nicki Minaj is my big uh, <laughs> Actually, recently I'd have to say uh, Christopher Bielman, uh, his first book, uh, Bob, refresh me on the title. Those Across the River. Thank you. It's been a very long week. Uh, there have been parts of that with the 
kind of post-colonialism and the it, the monsters in the forest that are unknown and unseen, but nobody goes across the river. So just simple little things like that you can work into games and without even giving a hint as to what's there, you're already kind of, oh, okay, maybe we'll be a little careful around there. All right, guys, you've been amazing. Probably all about you for yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Without your, without your no, that's fair. I uh, we don't have a television at the house, um, but I, I somehow managed to watch The Witch, and I thought that was a really that was a fun film. Just trying to uh, really really capture that that grungy, muddy, thatched wood smell of smoke and adventure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's, 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 a, there's a time travel adventure that I'm trying to write and trying to make something actually work and be cool like that and there's there's a, a crone in there. It may or be good, she may be bad, but that's, yeah, that was for me. Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, but anyways, we have, uh, I'm sure you guys all picked them up, but if you didn't stop by the booth and get a quick start book, please come on down and just thank you guys so much for your time tonight. It was a real privilege. Thank you.